Welcome, my friends, to another episode of The Art of Volunteering. Today's episode is going to tug at your heart. Uh, my guest today is Dee Gillen, the founder of the Black Poster Project. Dee lives in Haworth, a small town in Bergen County, New Jersey, with her husband, Greg, and together they raised three children, Scott, Deborah, and Eric. Dee, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Our mutual friend introduced us a short while back. Uh, the mission that you and the Black Poster Project is, is on is so meaningful and impactful, and I'd like you to share your story. Sure. So um, my story started um, on this path that I'm at right now. It started uh, about 17, 18 years ago when Scott was um, just getting out of high school or getting into high school, actually, is when it all kind of started. Um, you know, he, he started using uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, about that time, and it turned our life upside down and my family's life upside down, every one of us. Um, we lost him in 2015, on October 15th. And um, since then, it's just been a real journey of um, putting my ideas and uh, into, into action, um, helping to raise awareness. I'm trying to use the tragedy to help others. That's basically what it, what it is now. Can you share a little bit about who Scott was? Like just the, the person. Yeah. So Scott, um, he was a uh, very intelligent, very coordinated, very talented in sports. But um, it, we noticed when he was younger that all of his talent, he didn't really embrace it. You know, he would be um, an, an accelerated reader in grade school, and they would want to put him ahead of where his friends were at. He didn't want that. He wanted to be back where his friends were. In sports, he was very good at football, lacrosse, basketball. So he was always kind of a little head away from his friends. And we always look back at that and think that that was um, frustrating for him. So, you know, so he had these gifts. and. Um, Unfortunately, he didn't get to use them the way they should have been used. It presented more of a frustrating element in his life. But um, yeah, he, he was uh, very intelligent. Um, when I tell his story, I always reference how he went to take his, um, um, the uh, test of uh, going into college. I forget the name the of SATs? it. The SATs? Yes, the, the SATs. SATs. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> um, he went to test in the SATs. He never did any classes. He never did any studying. He showed up as they were literally closing the door with no calculator, nothing. And he got too wrong in the math section. And so he was really, really smart. Um, so that's how, that's, that's my boy. He was my firstborn. He was 27 when he passed. Wow. Okay. Not to make Scott a statistic, but almost... Um, in 2020, 92,000 92, drug overdoses occurred. That's just shy of 7,700 a month. This affects a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you and I were talking before the interview, um, you shared a little bit about how, how you had prepared yourself for the outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. You had to resign yourself. Can you just share a little bit about that to our listeners, what that process was? Well, um, it, it was a 10-year process. And somewhere in that process, um, my husband and I realized that this can go either way. He can recover or he won't, and he won't be with us. Um, and you know what? I just think that that is part of the process of what you deal with when someone you love is going through this. It can happen very easily. And um, you just have to be prepared either way uh, for the good ending or the not so good ending. So we started preparing somewhere around two years before his um, death. And to the point where we actually made a video and pictures for his wake, um, it sounds crazy and all, but it was a form of therapy that we had to do that for ourselves in order to get through this. And we put everything away. You know, he had an overdose in 2013. That's what made us realize, you know what, this might not be a good ending. And um, we did all that prep work. Um, he was clean. Uh, he overdosed twice, 2013, and then again, um, 
closer to 2014. He was clean for one whole year. So we were pretty happy, but we didn't, we didn't want to be off guard because, you know, anything can happen, especially with fentanyl, the way it's traveling through all of our communities. So mm -hmm. um, we prepared. And when he passed away, we had everything basically ready. I mean, literally, I had the readings and the prayers for the mass. Um, it was a, it, it's a really difficult process. Um, but I think that it's part of what you go through when someone you love is going through addiction. So unfortunately we, we had to go, we had to make that part of our plan. Okay. So where did the black poster project come from? How did this, what, how, explain a little bit about what it is and then explain how that helped you with the healing process. So what it is, is um, a project I started in 2019. Uh, I was speaking at an overdose awareness event in Piermont for a group, a local group in Nyack. Um, and so I was, I had an idea to make posters of people that were coming to the event that lost someone. And it was very pretty. It was on the Hudson River and we attached them to the fence. So it was behind the whole event and the speakers. And there were a lot of restaurants and people walking around. They kept coming over to look at the pictures and it was very impactful. They weren't necessarily coming to this event, but they were drawn in. And I realized that it, it was something that hit not just people going through this, but other people on the outside of this situation that they just wanted to know, who are these people? What happened to them? They're all smiling. They're all happy. What happened to them? And it gave um, families like us a way to express our stories. So, you know, from 2019, I started with about 48 posters, I think 50 posters, and now I have nearly 500. So um, we travel around and we are able to share our beloveds in the light that they should be seen in, not the way that they left this world. The real person, like, right. like yeah. Wow. Right. How, how many volunteers do you have to help you with these exhibits? It varies. Um, it takes three to four hours to set up a display that's indoors. Outdoors, it could take a little longer. It's a huge process. So the more hands we have to help, the better, the easier the job is. But um, it could take anywhere from, you know, a half a dozen to 25 people. You know, it all depends on who's available and who can come. And a lot of people will just show up to help okay. or they'll come to the display and they'll say, do you need any help breaking down? And then they'll just kind of stay and help us at the end. So it's hard to say how many, but it does take quite a, quite a bit of um, help to do each and every display. I'm a perfectionist. I want every single child on those posters to look perfect. And they should. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, uh, the Black Poster Project partners with Alumni in Recovery. Um, actually, they're the um, the found. She's the founder. Nancy Lavove is going to be um, a guest on an upcoming episode. But can you tell about the partnership that that you have, how you collaborate, and how it, how meaningful it is to both organizations? Mm -hmm. So we're both our own nonprofit, five hundred one three C. We're two separate organizations, but we met um, at that speaking and uh, the speaking event I was telling you about in two thousand nineteen. Nancy came right up to me at, after I finished speaking and she said, we have to work together. Well, she was right. <laughs> she <laughs> works with all people in recovery. That is her mission. I work with people that have lost their battle to um, addiction. And that's my mission. So we started working together. What's really unusual about it is that um, the first couple of years after Scott died, it was very awkward and a little frightening for me, I mean, for all of us, but, you know, people don't know what to say. People don't know what to say when they're face to face with somebody that has buried a child. It is so difficult to know what to say when you haven't experienced it. So I kind of felt a little void, but when I met Nancy, I realized that her and her organization, all the people in her organization literally embraced us. They wanted to be with us. I thought that was really unusual because you would think people in recovery would want to be uh, far away from 
the demise that our family is going through and so many others, right? But that's not what happened. They embraced us. And all of a sudden I felt like, you know what? This is home. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, working with all the people in recovery. It just was such a perfect match. And you don't really see it that often. You don't really see people in recovery and recovery organizations have a branch of the grieving families. She put this together and it is just an absolutely extraordinary combination. So we really enjoy working together. Now, a lot, several of those uh, alumni are volunteers for you. Yes. Yes. Well, okay. Nancy has she, part of her program, the Alumni Recovery Organization. She has a parent program. So she has a sub program within her organization. That's just parents that have lost children. So that's initially how I got involved with her was being part of that. I'm part of her parent program as well. So okay. we work to get like her her organization, People in Recovery, as well as the parents in the parent program are all part of my organization as well. So we are um, uh, partners, two separate organizations, but we work side by side in everything we do. How, how do yours, hers, you know, combine, how does this aid, uh, this aid in the recovery of an alumni? Like how, do, how does this help them? I think this is my opinion, but from what I see, they they want to keep what could happen to them close to the surface. So when they're um, at our displays and handling the posters and seeing reactions of people that come to look and see and read the stories, um, mm -hmm. it helps them to know this is important. I'm in program, I'm in recovery, and this being at these displays is the exact reason why I have to stay on my program. So I think it helps them just to keep things at the surface, not, you know, when you're in recovery, you don't want to move on like it never happened because you have to keep it. It's part of you. You have to keep what could be your demise. You have to keep that at the surface, never be complacent about it. Right. Okay. Um, shifting a little bit, but kind of the same vein, how does the Black Poster Project help in the healing of families who have lost someone? What's, what do they go through? Um, well, you know, everybody's different. Like the Black Poster okay. Project is a super heavy hearted project and it isn't for everybody. I have very good friends that have lost people and they want nothing to do with it because it's just too difficult. You're not only seeing your child on a poster, but you're seeing hundreds of others as well. But then there's a, another half of people like us, uh, like me, my family, and my friends that work on the project and the parent program. It helps. It helps to know you're not alone. All these other people have gone through the same thing. It's such a difficult journey. You don't know what it could possibly feel like. You know, we lose people in our lives parents or grandparents or, you know, pets and all, but to lose a child is a whole different process. It is like nothing I could even start to describe. It's very, very difficult. So when you put us all together, whether we're here at the display together or people, I have people in my project from here to Hawaii, we yeah. are together and we're a support for each other. So um, it does help. It helps a lot just to know that we're not alone. The other people, the other families that are in this project, we're not afraid to approach or ask questions or say I had a bad day. You know, I saw my son's best friend get married or had a baby, like things that our kids should be doing. You know, it's very difficult. The littlest things that you wouldn't even um, think would be an issue are. So people that are in this project, other families, we don't even have to know each other. We don't even have to have ever met, but we understand each other sometimes more than our own friends and families do. It's a support. I can see that. Can see that. How many families participate in the Black Poster Project? I have a, um, almost 470 right now. Okay. So um, they come to me. I, don't, so I can't solicit anybody because like I said, it's a very heavy hearted project. So 
It's not for me to say, I hear you lost your child. Would you like to be included in this project? It isn't for everybody. I wait till they come to me. So that being said, you know, within just a couple of years, it grows and grows and grows so much. So it goes from 48 posters to 470 posters. It's a lot. It's a huge amount of posters. Every family, every poster represents a family and, you know, friends of that person. It's, um, it's just huge when you see it all, all together. I, I like how, um, just in preparing, how you refer to them as souls. It just makes it so much more, I don't even know the right word, meaningful. Mm-hmm. That doesn't even scratch the surface. It was just, it, was, it just struck me the way you, you use the word souls. Just, yeah, I apologize. Well, I prefer- I, I'm at a loss for words for that. I just know that <laughs> struck me. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Um, and people that know me and have seen me with my project know that I treat them like they're my own children. I even refer to them as my kids and other people will say, where do you want the kids? You know, like we refer to them as if they're still here. And when all the volunteers come to help, they see that. They feel that. It mm-hmm. is like when you're put, picking up a poster to set it in place, like you're actually carrying the person. That's the feeling that that we don't tell them, treat them with respect. We don't have to say that. Um, people treat them as if they're still here. And that's how we refer to them. And that's how we treat them, the posters. They're sold. You know, they, yeah. they, um, they're still with us. Yes. And as long as we share their stories, they will remain with us. Correct. Yeah. All right. Share your, if you would, if you would share your most meaningful story with the Black Poster Project. I, I'm sure you have lots, but what was one that just kind of comes to the surface? Most meaningful story. Oh my God. It's so, that's a really hard one because <laughs> um, it is very difficult to answer that because every single one of them, I put myself into the story. I don't know if I could single one out, okay. but I can't, I can't say that when, um, when somebody will send me their information, they'll just send me a picture and add my son and the dates, their birth and death dates. And I write back and I say, I, I have to be with you. I have to be in your family. I have to work with you. It's not something that I do every poster, I don't just make it in a day. I work with each family. I want to hear their stories, funny things, not so funny things, what happened, so that I can make that poster with their love included. So it's kind of, it's hard for me to pick out one story. Every single one of them, I feel the same thing when I make every single poster and I do every single story and I work with every single family it's hard to pick one out because every one of them has a special effect on me. Yeah, it, they, they, I can see like when you talked about how they're still with us, but and then like your, your children, you, rel, you relive that each time you add a, a, a soul to your exhibit. Yeah. Like it's, a new, it's a new family member being brought into the fold. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, even though this is a heavy-hearted subject, can you share a blooper experience, <laughs> something that didn't go right and that you learned from and were yeah. able to use what you learned? Well, there's two stories. One is funny and one might not be so funny, but it was the lesson I learned, like you okay. had mentioned. Um, when we had done a display a couple of years ago, when the project was new, it hadn't even um, been, it wasn't even a 501 3C then. It just was like, that's just when we first started. And we did a display. And um, then in the beginning, it was a matter of people just like, hey, can you add my best friend? I just lost my boyfriend. I just lost this person. And I would add them, not even thinking anything about the magnitude of what I was doing. Um, so we had an event and this family came to the event. They had lost two sons to an overdose, one a few years prior, and then one more recently. I didn't have both sons. I just had the one in my project, the more recent one. They were coming just to kind of see, get support and, you know, be with other people going through what they were going through. And 
after the event that evening, the son called and he was like, my mother was so upset. You know, she didn't tell her friends what her son died of. And there he is on a poster in this overdose awareness event. So it really was a wake up call that I am handling treasured souls of people's yeah. families. And I have to treat them like that. That's where I really made a turnaround of, I have to have a consent form. It has to be the next of kin. And I'm going to talk and research and make sure, you know, look up the obituary and just make sure that, you know, everything is in check. So that was one lesson I really learned about if I'm going to do this, I have to treat them like they are my own children. So that was that one lesson. But there's a little funny story I could tell you. We do laugh, even though this is such a heavy hearted program and it is difficult and a lot of people come and they're very upset and crying when they come to these displays. But there was one that we did last summer and we set up the display and then we just kind of were sitting um, in a little circle while people were walking around and it was a beautiful sunny day. And all of a sudden I look over and there is a dog piddling on the back of one of the posters. <laughs> so it's, it's not that I'm laughing at that, like, it's just the, what happened. The dog, you know, had no idea. The person was looking at the posters. They didn't even understand. They didn't see it. And I'm watching this. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh so, my word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is cute. I like yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it was just a fun It, it story. is and it and isn't. Like, I, I'm with you. I can see I why mean, you would chuckle. I a punchy too. You know, you have to when you're doing stuff on this level, um, you know, this type of work. You know, we do laugh. We do go. We set up volunteers. They they think they're they're coming to like a mass wake, but they're surprised when they get there that you know we're people. Yeah, we've been through the un unimaginable, but we laugh. We still laugh, and we want you to laugh with us. See, we are at the point in the interview where I'm going to give you the floor and let you love on the Black Poster Project. Um, just why people should come out and see an exhibit, uh, why someone should consider volunteering, wh whatever you want, just love on your organization. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think like what I'd like to say about the Black Poster Project is um, it is something that I really wish people would come out and see, bring your children. We've created this place where it's soft and gentle and it is a place that if you wanted to have a conversation with someone that's going through addiction or just want to know more or trying to talk to your kids about it, but, you know, either they're not listening or they think, you know, they don't want to hear about it, bring them. It's not a scary thing. It is an, a gentle environment that we've created where our arms are wide open. We're ready to answer questions as parents, as siblings, um, people in recovery. What did we see? Did you see signs? Um, what can we do if we know somebody? So it's really a very impactful display that we put together between my organization and Nancy's organization. And it really is worthwhile to come and view it, but also, if you ever have a moment to help, um, it is an experience that I promise all volunteers will leave with more than they came with. Um, it is very emotional and something that, you know, it's an experience. It's an experience to come to and it's an experience to also hands-on help us. Um, and I don't think anybody that would want to volunteer would be disappointed if they took the time to do that. We need volunteers. That's all we run on. If we didn't have people, if we didn't have volunteers, we would never be able to do the work that we're doing right now. It is all volunteer. We don't charge for anything. Um, we, we don't charge for any family to be in the poster project. Um, okay. But we, we, we uh, do re require so much help. So mm -hmm. if we didn't have all the volunteers that came out to help us, we'd never be able to do this mission that we're doing. Dee, thank you for being um, a guest today. Um, I know that the, your mission for the Black Poster Project has touched at least one listener 
I'm, sh- I'm so sure of that. Um, and that, that you're going to be able, that they will find some healing as a result of our conversation. So I do want to thank you for that. And um, listeners, if you go to the show notes, there are a couple links on there. One kind of shows the, um, the exhibit in process. It shows it being set up and just, it, it, it brought it, that brought a tear to my eye. And then I listened to the next episode that Dee sent me about her story and, and Scott's story. Please take the time to listen to, to, um, to watch them. Um, it just adds so much of understanding to what Dee and I just spoke about. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me today and for including Nancy as well. Yeah, and, and just so um, our listeners know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day. Yeah. So take the time to pause and to reflect and remember, especially if you have lost someone who's dear to you and help, you know, be an encourager to someone who is living with a battle of addiction, um, just be aware, be sensitive, um, be a support to the families going through it. Uh, your simple act of kindness will mean so much um, in ways that you can't imagine. Absolutely. By the way, on August 31st, um, prosecutor of Bergen County, Prosecutor Masella, um, has uh, invited us to do a display in front of the Bergen County Courthouse, where he, nice. he is a very big supporter of our mission, both of our missions. So we'll be there on Overdose Awareness Day. Wonderful. Those living in Bergen County or the uh, the area around there, please take the time to go to the courthouse. Um, you will, I don't want to say you won't be disappointed. You will be moved in a way that you haven't um, ever been moved before. Yeah. So again, Dee, thank you. Thank you, listeners, for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you next time on the Art of Volunteering as we continue to connect volunteers worldwide. Have a great day. Bye-bye.